As usual, we're gonna go e4 and then bishop a6. And you guys, whoops, mouse slip, oh my god, what am I doing? Oh no, it's horrible, ay yeah, yeah. Oh my god, I meant to play, I meant to play an, an accelerated Ray Lopez with bishop b5. You see, this guy's like, what? Oh my god, I'm so stupid. Terrible, man. I gotta replace my- I gotta break my mouse. I mean, this is unacceptable. This keeps happening. Again and again and again. Okay. Knight takes a6. This guy takes correctly. He doesn't take b takes a6 like the last uh, guy that we did this with. Now, we- uh, Rome wasn't built in a day. Rome wasn't built in a day. And so, the first step when something like this happens, we're playing down a piece, we will have to unbalance the position, we will have to get attacking chances. But before any of that, we have to develop our pieces. It, you know, don't make the situation worse by doing something crazy. So we will begin with knight to f3, just developing our knight. Yeah, obviously. And the funny thing is, because we sacked a bishop, he can't go knight c6, so maybe that'll fluster him somehow. Uh, and make it a bit harder for him to orient himself in this position. D6 is good here. A Philidor up a piece is pretty, a little bit better than a Philidor, uh, which is not down a piece, up a piece. And he says, any mistake? Question mark. I, I can't talk on this account, so I'm just going to let him speculate. All right. D6. There you go. Philidor. Now, obviously... To get attacking chances, we will have to open the position up at some point. And just because we don't have a light squared bishop doesn't necessarily mean that we shouldn't open up the center. Um, so what, what move am I implying may have some meaning here? Because the funny thing is, d6 is a little bit passive. His bishop is restricted by the pawn. His knight on a6 is on the rim. So if we did have a bishop, we would play d4 as a no-brainer. But even without the bishop, d4 makes some sense. And we need to start planning. How are we going to unbalance the position? What are we going to do to create some sort of intrigue that will perhaps confuse him and give us chances? The easiest way, the easiest formula to unbalancing the position is to castle the opposite side of what, of what your opponent is castling. Of where your opponent is castling. So if he's castling king's side, which is 99% uh, going to be true, then we should orient ourselves toward castling queen's side. The other thing to remember is that you shouldn't automatically take free pawns when they're offered to you if you're down a piece. Because obviously if you play d takes e5, d takes e5, and then you trade queens and you play knight takes e5, and you celebrate that you've won a pawn, well first of all you blunder mate in one due to rook d1, but even if there was no mate, trading queens would be way too steep of a price to pay for a single pawn when you're down a piece. So bishop g4 is a phenomenal move by, by our opponent. So we need to deal with this in a different way. In a certain sense, we need to keep this pawn on d4. We need to defend it. Now, the best way to defend a pawn is typically with another pawn. So what kinds of moves come to mind here? Okay, so queen d3 would escape the pin, but it wouldn't necessarily defend the pawn. I like the move c3. And I like that you guys know this move from all the Ray Lopez's that we've had. And we've played this move all the time. It's a good move. Building up a little pawn chain, keeping our pawns in the center. Of course, bishop b7, that's good. All right, now we need to think about how to continue our development. Um, you know, th there isn't anything truly uh, appealing that we can do at this very moment. We have to finish our development before... We have to play very patiently, in a sense. If we go crazy and we, we go queen a4 check, that doesn't do anything. We don't have anything developed. So knight d2 has the drawback of blocking in the bishop. So can we can we circumvent that problem by changing the order of our development? Yes. We can start with bishop e3. Of course, bishop g5 blunders the bishop due to bishop takes g5. So we start with bishop e3, then knight bd2. If you're down a piece, um, then you know every single piece that's not developed hurts you quite a bit more than when there's equal material. No, of course we're lost. Like, everything is bad here. But we're trying to make the most of the situation. Knight b to d2. Yeah, thank you, Tension. Have a, have a, good, have a good one. He castles. Okay. And now, of course, as I explained, 
the ideal plan would be to move the queen and castle queenside. The risks of that are very obvious. We've already played c3. That's a weakening move. So if we were to castle queenside, our king's safety would be greatly at risk. But we're not in a position to, to like choose, and we're not in a position to experience any kind of luxury in our king's safety. So queen c2 is interesting. I still probably prefer queen e2. Yeah, we could also play queen b3, but the problem with queen b3 is that he might take our knight. I feel like that queen would get vulnerable once we castle the queen. So we need our queen to somehow be able to participate in a future kingside attack. That's what I'm trying to say. If we put our queen too far away on the queen side, then if we were to develop some sort of a pawn storm on the king side, the queen wouldn't be close enough to participate in the attack. So I don't think escaping the pin is the top priority here. I don't think escaping the pin is the top priority here, but we should have the capacity to end the pin when we want to. So we should start with the move h3. Now, of course, he can take the knight and he can trade. That's not necessarily good for us, but at least it eliminates a headache of a bishop and lets us activate our queen and prepare to castle. So we do accomplish some of the things that we wanted to, uh, in, in particular, eliminating the bishop. And now we have, you know, a pretty clear plan of going g4, g5 and beginning the pawn storm right yeah we could have considered g takes f3 and open the g file but the g file alone would not have done us too many favors and i'll show you guys why after the game that's a good question yeah that's it, it's a bit hard to explain i'll have to show it he says do you want draw <laughs> but no no that was earlier i mean he thinks it's a mouse if he's trying to be nice Okay, c5. Now, we need to be very careful here as to how we approach this. Because if I'm reading the chat correctly, I think a lot of you would have the tendency to go d5 here. And d5 is bad. d5 is very bad. Because d5 closes down the center and it unties his hands completely for an attack on the queen side. He can go b5 and then c4 and b4. And he's so much faster than us. His queen comes out to a5, right? So in a certain sense, by keeping the center open, you're diluting the his ability to attack our queen side in, an un, in a completely unfettered way. In addition, in addition, he's weakened a lot of squares by playing c5. I know it sounds completely irrelevant, but he's weakened this square. He's sort of blunted his own bishop. The knight on a6 can't go to c5 anymore. So by keeping the center open, we are emphasizing the superiority of our pieces. And I'll tell you guys more, we can actually play positionally even though we're down a piece. That's not doesn't mean that we can't make any positional moves. So what comes to mind here? Yeah, so first of all, we can castle. Um, but I like the move knight c4. The pro There's only one problem with knight c4. Knight c4, he can slide his queen into d3. And that's an incredibly nasty move, queen to d3. So I would risk it and castle. I would risk it and castle first because this gives us the possibility of attacking the king side. That plan is still in is still very much available. That plan is still very much available. Queen a5. Of course we have to defend the pawn. A lot of you would go a3 here automatically, but you don't want to make any more weaknesses on the queen side. We already have gone c3. So, of course, King B1 is the automatic response. Now, if he attacks in a very focused way, he's going to win. But we are banking on the fact that he hesitates or that he gets scared of our attack. And, you know, that's where we just got to pray. It's, it's out of our hands. We're doing what we can. I've, we've made some progress toward complicating the game. He's playing very well. He's playing very well. But it's not as easy as it was when we gave the piece up. Okay, so let's try to understand what our plan is. What is our plan? Can somebody lay out the general, how are we going to attack his king side? What, what is the series of steps here? Now, I, I've indicated this move G4 many times. What is the function of G4? What is the purpose of the pawn storm? What does the pawn storm do? It does two things. The first is that it removes the knight from F6. That's the main defender. That's the gatekeeper. 
the initial gatekeeper. Once the gatekeeper is gone, we push the other pawn to h5 and we try to go g6. There are There's one fundamental purpose of a pawn storm, and that is to break open the cover of his king. There is another related purpose of a pawn storm, and that is to use the pawns to secure squares for your pieces. That's a lesser known application of the pawn storm. I'll talk about that after the game. But the, you know, most of the pawn storms that you see in the Sicilian and all those traditional attacks, you try to advance your pawns and sacrifice them to open files for your rooks and queen. I was going to say rooks and queens, but if you have more than one queen, you don't really need a pawn storm. And again, I'll, I'll tackle all, all of your individual questions afterward. Yeah, well, DZ, I'm worried about it, but this is a move that's good for us because his rook should have been on b8, and there comes b5. Well, we've entered a point of no return. We've entered a point of no return. We have to, we have to continue our attack and just pray that somehow we end up being faster than he is. If only we had a light-squared bishop. We got to send it. No choice. H4. Only way. I mean, there's just no other way to attack. Literally. You don't need to be a GM to make these moves. All in. I'm okay. Okay. This is good. You see, he panics. He panics. He's trying to slow down the progress of her pawns. But in doing so, he creates a pawn hook. He makes it a lot worse for himself. Why? Why is this move so bad? Can somebody explain that to me? Of course, we go h5. And this pawn, by acting as a hook, allows us to open the h file a lot faster. And all we need is one open file. As long as we can open a file, we're going to be good. We're going to have enough avenues and streets to create serious threats against this king. This might not be winning yet, but the position has been greatly complicated. That's why the rule exists, to warn you against pushing pawns on the side where you're being attacked. Now, what I want you guys to understand is that h takes g6 will be hasty. We don't want to play h takes g6 too quickly. What move do we want to play first to prepare h takes g6? The threat is stronger than its execution. We have only one shot to open the h file. We want to go queen to h3. We want to double up first and then take on g6. That may seem absurd. Why? Who can explain to me why we want to play queen h3 here? And that is a crushing move. What's wrong with taking and then going queen h3? Because of course, yeah, he has f takes g6 and he's going to use that f7 square for his rook to defend the pawn. So by keeping things closed until we need to open them, we disallow defensive moves like rook f7. I think he has no defense. I think he's busted. This is going to come. And then this h file massacre is going to happen whether he likes it or not and this move g6 lost him the game there's nothing he can do because if he takes then we take and it's the same thing he did trap his own queen but that's much less important yeah this is nice this was a very nice game 17 moves only it seemed like a lot longer didn't it <laughs> It seemed like 50, like we were trying this and that, but it was only 17 moves. All right, I'll give him a draw because he, I agree with that notion. Now the ratings are refunded anyway, but I will give him a draw as a symbolic gesture. It is made though. This is literally made in two. I mean, the may will come on the next move. Because if, 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 if I made one more move, he might have resigned. So I'll give him the draw. No, I, on, on your, I think your guys' suggestion was a good one. I agree. And it's, it's good, you know, bishop a6. That was very sweet of him to just sort of assume it was a mouse slip and to offer a draw. That's nice. So I'll... The point is, we, we made the comeback here. Yeah, wholesome stuff by our opponent. He might just resign, I don't know. Maybe he'll he'll not understand. I think what's going through his head right now, I think what's, what's going through his head right now is that he thinks, he thought he was mated, 
Now he's suspicious that I offered a draw. So he's looking for some crazy, crazy resource um, that, that he thinks I may have missed. That often happens. Yes, of course, Godnag, I'll show you everything. Can you revoke the draw? No. So there's a couple of stories that I have. Um, in scholastic tournaments, this is a very common thing that kids do when they're not very well behaved. Uh, I've been witness to this, where a kid will offer a draw tauntingly in a winning position. The other kid will accept. And then the first kid will say, I never offered a draw. And, you know, the other kid will call over the TD, but there's no proof. Assuming that there's nobody sitting next to them, there's no proof that you offered a draw. Anybody could say, well, my opponent offered me a draw here. So that's something I've... I've heard stories about several times. This has never happened to me. Although I've played kids who've offered me draws like 15 times in a row in a completely lost position. That's pretty common. And then, of course, I had my most epic story ever about the kid who tried to cheese me into blundering mate and ended up losing a piece. And then he started crying. And then, of course, I felt bad. That was the same kid who, would, who declines it. He declined it. Oh, man. Well, okay, that's fair. That's fair. Okay, fine. So what do we need to do here? Do we need to take Do we need to take the knight? Do we need to react to this move? Really, Brandon? Wait, who? Who? Do we need... No, no, no. God forbid. Do not take this knight. Do not pass go. Ignore everything. Make sure that he's not threatening checkmate. If he had gone knight b4 then yes, we would have had to take his knight. When you are on the cusp of mate, one piece of advice, pay attention to what your opponent is doing because he might make these spite moves to, to threaten something. And if you just tunnel vision your idea, you might at the last second miss some crazy idea. It was over. It's over. You won't say it. Fair enough. Yeah, so knight takes e2. We can, we can take with either piece. Rook takes e2 has more of an elegance to it. Queen takes h5, obviously, and mate is on the board. Nice game. To offer a draw over the board, you usually say, I offer a draw. Sorry, he didn't lose. You usually say, you, you play a move and you say, I offer a draw, or you, you can you can say, just say draw. Uh, if you're playing international chess or you're playing world youth, you, you make this symbol, because if if it's assumed that your player, that, you know, that there's no common language. Absolutely, it was. Okay, there's a lot to unpack in this game. Amazing move, Bishop A6. Thank you for the 300 dynasty speed run explained. All right. Yeah, sure, her, her. So D64, opening up the center. And I like his move, Bishop G4. Had Igani takes D4, had Igani takes D4, which piece would we have taken with? This is an interesting question to test your guys' understanding of what our ultimate plan is. Think about how we want to get our pieces out. Very nice. Queen. Queen because, first of all, he's got no knight c6. And second of all, because we want to castle along ASAP. And to do that, we need to clear our queen off the board. Then we want to go knight c3, bishop g5, and quick castle. And perhaps we can even go e5 quickly if he doesn't develop efficiently. So that's... um what we would have done. C3, right? Defending the pawn. Now, why do we want to cast along? Because, thank you, Scatman, for the tier one. Because, as I explained, the easiest way to unbalance a position is to generate attacking chances. And to generate attacking chances, you generally need to castle to the side that is opposite of the side that you're attacking, assuming that you're using your pawns. If you're using your pawns to attack, and you're castled on that same side, it's going to be a lot harder to do that without weakening your king. That should be intuitively obvious. So castling to the opposite side basically says, I won't need to worry as much about my king safety. I can throw my pawns on my opponent, and I don't need to factor in that additional variable. But does that mean that it is impossible to attack on the same side where you're castled? Absolutely not. It's possible even to attack with a pawn storm, but that requires quite often a lot more skill, and uh, you know there's a lot more risk attendant to that. Okay, so c3, uh, defending the pawn. Well, 
it also stops Knight B4, which is a nice byproduct of it. But the main reason I played C3 is just to buttress the pawn. Because if we make a random move, he can simply take the Knight. And we either have to ruin our structure or give up another pawn. And that's just too much. So C3 is, is sort of a necessity. Okay, so Bishop B3 completing the development. Knight BD2. That's the only way for us to complete the development. Now, after H3... I think this was the beginning of his troubles. I would play bishop h5 if I were black. Because if we go g4, our position collapses. The pawn on e4 is a tremendously weak pawn. The center is going to open, and it's going to open up before we get a chance to castle long. So, for example, if you go queen c2 here, black can strike with d5, exploiting the pin. This is just totally crushing. So something like that would have been very difficult to defend against. Yeah, so keeping the king in the center can often be a good strategy if you think the center can be the safest place to keep the king. That that sometimes happens. Um, okay. Yeah, bishop e6 is fine, but yeah, but then black has to give up the pawn. But then black has to give up the pawn, which is a reasonable thing to do, but perhaps he didn't want to do that. All right. So a lot of you are asking, why not gf to open up the g file? And... What, what you should understand is that how, do you, how should you think of an attack? You should think of an attack as sort of a cumulative set of factors that together give you chances to mate your opponent's king. And when you look at this position, you say, ah, well, I've got the G file. You're already imagining something happening on G7. But one open file alone is not enough it, it, it's not enough substance to generate serious threats in most cases. Why is that? What's an example of a defensive setup that black can adopt to prevent damage along the G file? Black can play the move G6 here. Now, I know it was bad in the game, but I'm associating this with a very specific follow-up. Okay, so let's say rook G1. Now I'm going to put my knight on H5. Why am I doing this? I'm doing this to blockade the pawn to prevent the move F4. Just freeze both of the pawns. And if I need to, I'll move my king away to h8. I could even fianchetto my bishop. Just, just to cover all the bases entirely. So, as you guys can see, even though we're occupying the g-file, there isn't enough real estate available on the king side. The market is too hot. We can't push our pawns. You can't create more weaknesses. And black has too many defenders. So... G takes f3 makes too many positional sacrifices for a benefit that isn't substantive enough to give serious attacking chances. Does that make sense? I don't know if that makes sense. So when you're considering whether to do something like this, take with a pawn to open a file. You have to put things in the broader context. Is the open file the only thing I'm getting? Am I getting other benefits? Will I be able to provoke more weaknesses? And particularly if you're down a piece, you need to keep your options as open as possible. All right. Yeah, you need the G pawn as a as an instrument of the pawn storm. Thank you. Okay, so C5, I believe, is a mistake. Good night, Brandon. Get, get, great games. Give him a follow, by the way. He ain't too shabby himself. All right. Um, now, C5 is a very awkward move. And the reason I know it's an awkward move is because I've made this mistake myself. A lot of the times that I immediately identify whether a move is good or bad is because I simply have the experience of either playing it or facing it and getting chastised for it. And I played C5, I remember playing C5 in a completely different position, but it was it was a mistake for a very similar reason. And uh, this was one of my first games against, against the Grandmaster. I think my very first game against the Grandmaster, I made a very similar mistake. So... This is my game against Mela Kachian, who is a who is an Armenian grandmaster now lives in LA. Uh, but now he, I mean, he's a uh, he's a good friend. I've known him for many years, and uh, this was my first ever game against a GM. Yeah, in in 2007, I was 2100. So I was I was you know I was pretty good. Um, so we have a position where it's sort of like a a perk or a King's Indian type of structure, chaos and idea thing for the prime, and. Guess what move I played in this position as black? Guess what move I played here? I played c5, yeah. 
So my reasoning was that I'm trying to contest this. I'm trying to control more of the center. You know, I'm trying to push upon in the center. But I simply ignored the fact that the first thing is that I'm creating a giant hole on d5. This is a square which can never be defended by the c pawn again. And what Melek does is eventually he puts a knight on d5, right? Eventually he creates a plan where he's going to move his knight out. Then he's going to use his dark squared bishop and trade it for the only defender of the square. And then ideally he's going to bring the knight around to d5, which is exactly what he does. Takes h4. Okay, he provokes other weaknesses, so it's not that simple. But basically he runs circles over me using all of these weaknesses that I've created. And it all... It all centers around the d5 square. So I got crushed. Positionally crushed. Um, and it's very similar if we transfer that to the, uh, the speedrun game. Again, it creates a huge hole in d5. And it really makes all the pieces just dull. Alright, so maybe I'm belaboring the point here. But c5 in such situations, you got to be very careful about. What I would do instead is probably go c6. Same idea, you want to open up the queen in preparation for castle long, but this is better in the sense of preparing b5, b4, etc, etc. So c5, and so on and so on. d takes c5, d takes c5. Castle's long. This is a must, because otherwise our king is just going to be stranded in the center, and we can't allow that. Um, so yeah, why not d5? This is a bit hard for me to explain, but the bottom line is, is Nimzovich, Aaron Nimzovich, who I was a frequent uh, reference on this stream, right? He wrote my system. He makes the analogy of sort of a dentist who fills a cavity. You know, C5 creates a cavity on D5, and Nimzovich talks about it as like when you close the center prematurely, you you basically give your opponent a free visit to the dentist. He no longer has a cavity because it's filled with a pawn. And these pawns on c5 and e5 are not protected by d6. Let me make it another color. The pawn on d6, which I've, I'm going to highlight in green, is protecting its counterparts on e5 and c5. And the bottom line is that black can still attack on the queen side. You're closing the center, but you're not preventing black from attacking on the queen side. Now, by opening the center, you are diluting black's attention. This pawn is weak. Sorry, whoops. Did not mean to do that. There we go. This pawn is weak. You have an x-ray going. Who knows? This is kind of in white's favor. And maybe you can use the d5 square later. We're not ruling out the fact that this knight, much like in that game that I just showed you, is going to make its way to d5. So it's not that black can't use it to his advantage. Thank you, Aiko. It's that black is unlikely to use it for his advantage. There's nothing about the d-file that is in black's favor other than the fact that black could use it to trade a bunch of pieces because he's up a piece. That's a risk we're taking. Now, I don't know if it makes sense, if that makes, if I could explain this in, in another way, but that's the bottom line logic. Okay, queen a5. Now, of course, we go king b1. The reasoning is simple. We have to defend the pawn on a2. The reason that a3 is a bad move here is exactly the same reason that g6 is a bad move here. This creates a hook. And now we have two hooks, and black can exploit those hooks by just exploding a pawn on b4. That's going to guarantee that the position rips apart. You want to go king, b1. Well, king c2 doesn't defend the pawn. King c2 doesn't defend the pawn, right? Uh, maybe you want to go here, but the queen has a nice way out via e6. Also, the king on c2 is a lot more susceptible to various checks and sacrifices. All right, so our opponent started going astray here. I would straight away go for b5, right? I would go b5, but this is the hardest moment for black because a lot of people would automatically go b4. Now, who can explain to me why b4 is not a good move? b4, and it isn't a good move, for several reasons, actually. Well, knight c4 isn't really a fork. Because first of all, I don't really care about this pawn. I can go queen b5 and x-ray the king. And even if I wanted to care about it, I could go back to c7. The reason is c4. And look at how the queen side is sort of locked up. Knight and queen are staring at this pawn. And it's hard for black to make progress. On the other hand, we're going to start pushing our pawns. So what should black do here? How should black ensure that the attack does not die after black plays b4? This is a very important technique. Very important technique. 
First, you play c4, and then you play b4. You fill the cavity, then you play b4, even if it means sacking this pawn. So after g5, I would move the knight, let's say knight, yeah, knight e, maybe even knight e8, because knight d7 would stand in the x-ray of the rook. Yes, this disconnects the rooks, but you can get the knight around to d6. So h4, knight d6, h5, and here comes b4. And this is a beautifully placed knight that's defending the pawn. And black is crushing here. White just isn't in time. You can go g6, bc, black, you know, we can take h7. The king can use the pawn as an umbrella. You can see that white is a little bit close. If we had three, four more moves, we would have gotten somewhere. But black is literally all over white's throat. So that would be the best way for black to guarantee that his attack would be faster. Our opponent plays rook a to d8, which is a good move in general, but a waste of time given the specific properties of the position, which is that he needs to attack ASAP. So a hook is sort of a something you latch onto. So think about why a pawn storm is conducted. You conduct a pawn storm to open up the king set, right? These are hooks. They're still hooks. Just because they haven't moved doesn't mean they act as hooks. A hook is an opponent's pawn that you are trying to make contact with to open up files. But when a pawn is advanced, literally just mathematically, it is, you know, your pawn advance that makes contact with it is going to come much faster. And it might even be more, the more pawns act as hooks, the more explosive it is, the more files may open. All right. All right. Now, again, I don't want anybody to take this as gospel. There are plenty of situations, plenty of situations where you do want to push pawns and create hooks. There's a very compelling, sometimes there's a very compelling reason to do so. Sometimes what may seem like a hook is actually a way to slow down the attack. There's a lot of these variables that you have to factor in. And I can give you plenty of examples. I can give you plenty of examples of moves that may seem completely unplayable because they help the opponent, but in reality, slow down an attack that otherwise would have been quite devastating. Right? There's, there's just a lot of complexity when it comes to attacking. It's like h4, meeting h4 with h5. And I can give you a very simple example just to contextualize this, although this is far from what I really mean by this. This is just a skeletal kind of example. This is the King's Indian Samish variation. Now you can see that white's going to castle long and we're going to have opposite side castling. My opponent goes g4. And his plan is to checkmate me in the very typical way. He's going to go h4, h5, and just going to open the h bomb mate. So what do you think black can do here? It's a very odd looking move if you've never seen this idea before, but it has the effect of keeping the H files blockaded, H5. You meet G4 with H5. And you might say, well, wait a minute, doesn't the H file open up? Well, kind of, but he still has a pawn on H2, which is the important part. And this knight acts as a blockader, not permanent, but it buys you time to attack on the queen side. Most of the defensive techniques that you execute are in the end, ways to buy yourself time so you can attack more rapidly on the other side. It's not about stopping your opponent's attack permanently, although that would be nice. It's about buying yourself time. And if he goes h3, then we just, you just keep the pawn on h5. You use it as a deterrent. You could even shove it to h4. And even though white would eventually win that pawn, it would take him a while to do that and then move the bishop back away and then go h4. Try. It's like knockout in basketball, right? You, you use your basketball to hit your opponent's basketball. And by the time that they run and get it and make a basket, you've already made 18 layups. It's, it's the same kind of principle, right? You sacrifice a pawn. By the time he get, takes that pawn and moves the bishop away and moves the h pawn, that's like five, six, ten feet. All right. Okay. Well, if g5, then you can go knight e8, or you can go knight h7. You know, I would go knight e8 and maybe you reroute the knight like this eventually. Yeah. Okay, so not to get too sidetracked. Um, and those of you who find this concept intuitive, you know, sorry to, to be laborious. So g4, b5, g5, knight d7, h4. But really the decisive mistake comes here. g6 is a very, very, very bad move. And once again, I think had he gone c4, and then had he gone either b4 immediately, and knight takes c4 is not scary. Why is this not scary? Where should the queen go? Where should black's queen go? And I already mentioned this move in a different context. 
Nanuka, yes, that can be a very effective method. Of course, queen b5 creating the x-ray attack in the knight, and b takes c3 is going to be crushing. But if for whatever reason you were worried about this, you could go knight to b6 and then b4. And still, I think black's attack is much faster. So g6 is the decisive mistake. H, no, h6 just allows g takes h6. g6, h5, and I... I think the black and black has a very advanced defensive technique here. Oh, but there's a beautiful line. No. Nope. So the advanced defensive technique is to say, I need to defend the h7 pawn at all costs. Who can, well, knight f6, we just take it, Paula. Who can, who can uh, identify a method of defending this pawn in time? This is a very common method in the Sicilian and various openings where you encounter an h attack. It's rook e8 and knight f8. And black is in time to hold this together. But after rook e8 there, you have to notice that the f7 pawn has been weakened. Well, who gives a damn about that, right? Who gives a damn if the f7 pawn is weak? It's not like you can put a rook on f1 and x-ray through the f2 pawn. Well, you kind of can. H takes g6. And now another relatively common tactical pattern. Rook takes h7. Overloading. King has to take the rook, otherwise it's mate. Check. Checkmate. Ooh. Again, a pattern that if you've done a lot of puzzles, you've seen before, I'm quite sure. Yeah. Um, it's a very, I really like this one though. Why not f6 and rook f7? Well, f6, you're not in time. h takes g6. I'm not going to let you put a rook there. And now I'm going to go queen h3. Maybe the king can run, but that looks absolutely miserable. So this is going to be a very one-sided king hunt. How would you break the umbrella if you didn't go g6? Well, like I said, if you didn't go g6 and didn't do anything, I would have gone h5 and then probably g6 myself and try to explode stuff. Yeah, sure. So, um, and I'm always happy to repeat stuff. So g6, h5, I was saying rook f8. This weakens the f7 pawn. So we start by taking on g6. Now, you might say, but, but didn't you say that it, you should delay this move until you're ready to take it? Well, that was in the event that he doesn't do this. Here, sorry, my voice cracks. Here, the circumstances have changed. You need to exploit the f7 square while you still can. And you do that by sack sacking the rook on h7. You're threatening checkmate, so he has to take the rook. Now, you don't want to give this check. This check would be very hasty because the king just moves aside. And then if we go here and say, ah, it's me. Well, he obviously just defends. So instead, you want to start by giving this check, cornering the king, and then mating on an h1. Does that make sense? Now, if he doesn't take my pawn back on g6, well, what, what does he do? I mean, you're threatening queen takes f7, or rook takes h7. It's not like he's on the doorstep of mating me. He's five or six moves away himself, but we don't have to worry about any of that. Right? Okay. What if sacked bishop g7? I'm not sure what you wear. What if he plays h6? Yeah, well, that's a problem. Well, that's the that's a problem. And normally we have more pieces in the attack. You could sack on h6. I mean, let me show you guys a quick example of how, how this kind of stuff works. What I wanted to show you, I can just make moves here um, myself. So normally in the Sicilian, let me just let me just very quickly approximate what could happen. So this is like a, a common line of the Sicilian. Now what often happens is you get a situation like this and let's make random moves for black. So this is similar, but different because if you go G6 and black goes H6, you often have this battery already pre-built. So you can just snap the pawn on H6 and this is checkmate because Knight F6, for example, to defend the square, you can go G7, you can take, everything is crushing. So oftentimes you have this response. Oftentimes you can take on f7 and use the g file. The problem is, and th this is where you just have to put things in context, because we're down a piece here, um, g6 is just not that dangerous. So I agree. I agree that in, in this position, it would be a lot harder to get stuff done. But maybe one thing we could do is go rook g1, or perhaps you could consider a bishop sack. And then rook g1. I mean, this looks interesting, right? This doesn't look easy to defend against. We're threatening this and this. There's all sorts of very cool stuff that can arise from this. I don't know if I'm making sense. You could just keep throwing pieces at your opponent and hope that something good comes of it. 
Sometimes that's what attacking is all about, right? So there's no clear science to this. Remember that your ultimate goal when you're pawn storming is to either open up your opponent's king. That's the main reason. Another thing that you can do with a pawn storm is use the pawns to weaken squares. That can be the case in the event of a lobster pincer. So if we reposition black's pieces and we have this position and it's white to move, who can propose an even more effective way? What would we do here? Would we still go g6 or would there be a better idea? And I've given you, of course, a very big hint. Why is all of this significant? Now his pieces are all away from the king's side. h6 is very common. Yeah, and this is lobster pincer. But if we, if we did something as small as reposition a rook on e8, h6 would already be bad. Because this is a very narrow... You're putting all of your eggs in one basket, and if it doesn't work, uh, you know, there's a good Russian expression, you're at a broken gate. All of a sudden, you end up without what you thought you would have, if that makes sense. Your SOL. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, we have all been there. So you got to be very careful. When you're when you're making a, a very specific move like H6, you got to be careful that it is, in fact, lobster pincer bait. G6 is safer because you guarantee that you open files. All right? But that's why one of the most common mistakes that players make when they learn about pawn storms is they forget that the ultimate goal is to open files. So they forget that they can sacrifice pawns in order to open files. You don't need to prepare pawn storming moves. For example, sometimes um, if you're trying to open the G file and you want to go G4, but the G4 square is defended, you can still go G4 because if the opponent takes on G4, you've succeeded in opening the G file. You're fine sacrificing pawns. And I have a very simple example of that before we move on to the next game. So we have a dark squared bishop and this bishop is uncontested. It is very clear that we want to attack white's king. So as I put a little bit more sugar in my tea, who can propose the best and most efficient method of starting the attack against white's king, applying the concept that I just outlined? And then we'll move on. And a lot of you guys will spot this immediately, but um, I see a lot of you indicating the correct idea. Now, I've given this position by now to all of my students, um, ranging from like 1,000 to 2,400. And I would say that the threshold where people start finding the move very quickly, the correct move, is about 17, 1800. At a 17, 1800 level and above, people say b5 almost immediately. That is the correct move. That is the correct move. Um, and the reason that is the correct move is because it, it is a multi-purpose move. You are preparing c4 and then a5 and b4. You're going to use the pawns to destroy him. And if knight takes b5, which is what deters some other players from playing this move, well, then you've opened up the b file and black is completely winning. It's not one of those things where you're opening it up and then you're exploiting it. You just go rook b8 and the game is over. Because as soon as the bishop moves, b2 is going to fall. If white tries to es establish the bishop on b5, then you use your a-pawn, dislodging the bishop and winning the game. Um, but some of the lower rated people will either suggest a6 first to prepare b5 or bishop d7. Bishop d7, by the way, is not a bad move, but it's a little bit inefficient. And I like that nobody cared about this one. This is another pawn that you are sacrificing, by the way, which nobody cares about. Let him take this pawn. It doesn't hurt you. So b5 is the most efficient way to attack. If he plays bishop takes b5, yeah, I see what you want to do. But I, for starters, I can play bishop takes c3 and win a piece. For starters. Um, but I'm sure that I have other moves as well. No, my opponent took on f5. I played c4, bishop b4, a5. I mean, look how effortlessly the attack goes. Rook h1, queen f6, loading up the battery, just getting out of the x-ray, b4, and now knight b5 occupying the square left behind the pawn. Knight takes c4, bishop b7. I've given up the c pawn to open up the c file now. And now I'm getting a rook to c8, knight to d4. And the final move of the attack is very, very nice. And this is the third purpose of pawns. Pawns can be used as anchor points for pieces. I won't tell you the move. I want people to find the move. 
use one of Black's pawns as an anchoring point for a piece to go onto a devastating square. The move is a4, and you want to go knight b3 and take not just take the rook, but checkmate him on b2. For example, check and queen b2 is a very pretty checkmate. I mean, look at how all the pieces essentially are cooperating in a, in a just totally devastating attack. Overabundance of p. You could do this without a bunch of these pieces. Um, well, knight takes b5 is mostly intuition, but the calculation is very simple. You don't need to see a6, for example, because you should, even if you reach this point and don't see the move a6, you should still go for this. You should sense that the b file is so valuable. You could, you could even go bishop d7 here. Worst comes to worst. So knight can't take queen because, because of the pin. Because the knight is pinned to the king. Um... But the bottom line is that you don't always need to prepare these moves. You can play them immediately. Sometimes you do need to prepare them, but a lot of the time you're pawn storming to open files. So the lesson here that you can just kind of throw your pawns at your opponent and it's a win-win. If he takes those pawns, then you've got open files. If he doesn't take the pawns, well then you use those very same pawns and push them forward and expose more weaknesses. All right. Um, that pawn from a7 is what wins the game. Look at how that pawn, it goes from a7 to a5 to a4, and he resigned here. He resigned in this position because knight b3 is utterly unstoppable. All right, beautiful.